Hello there, Seraphim17 once again. This is my Sekiro walkthrough, and we're moving into the second segment, which is going to cover the wolves' travels through the Harata estate, all the way up to getting the stone after the corrupted monk in Mibu village. And uh, the footage that you're about to watch here, guys, got interrupted quite a lot for several reasons, and I had a bit of a difficulty sticking it all together and it stems from the fact that the shrines in this area, the idols that you rest at uh, to reset the state of the world uh, are kind of spaced apart. There's about one that's midway through after we get this first one and then once you get to the top the next one is pretty much at the next area where you jump past a bunch of lanterns and what have you so uh, I was doing a lot of quitting out and things of that nature uh, to compensate for some some of the real life stuff that was happening because sometimes when I'm recording things like this I don't always get the opportunity to to do the segments that I would like to do with them and it, it leads me to doing creative things to kind of link up the footage uh, as you all know guys th these are edited this is not a one take of a lot of the stuff that you're watching and uh, a lot of the times when you quit out in this game it puts you in a position that you weren't in before and I have to uh, go back to a lot of idols and run back and then and then seamlessly try to edit the footage back together and what have you to to try and make it a bit cohesive for people to follow and sometimes that can be really easy and the cuts can be very elegant and I can place them in places that I need to 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 blend in with what your eye can see and then at other times it just doesn't work like that at all so I, I apologize in advance if anybody gets confused. <laughs> but I jump into this courtyard to start engaging with uh, the two enemies. There's a bow guy over there. There's a guy with an axe that's going to be teleporting over here. And uh, one piece of advice with these axe men. Just don't even bother, right? One of the things I've learned by playing this game is there is this tendency for enemies to, to have these attacks that swing so goddamn slow you seem to wait an eternity for it to happen. And with this guy, because he has armor, if you attack him, you can usually kill him before he has chance to even swing. But because I want to showcase the game a decent amount for people that might be engaging with it more than I am, I wanted to, to show him swinging and deflecting and showing that, you know, you can kind of circumvent what he does. But you need to be aware, he does a really, really slow swing and then a really fast, like, hooking punch afterwards. And if you don't know it's coming, it will hit you every time. But the reason we're coming to the Hirata estate is because now we have the Senpu kicks. And when you have the temple kicks, they're going to enable you to do a lot of damage to, to Lady Butterfly, which might make this fight a bit easier for people that aren't very good at it. That being said, I do think that Lady Butterfly is one of the easiest bosses in the game because she's essentially the person that teaches you the cadence of the battle system. Which, which is to say that if you attack out of turn, you're going to get fucked up. But this room here over to the right has a lot of dogs in it, it has a lot of soldiers in it, it has a lot of drunken soldiers in it, and uh, one of the best ways to deal with this area is to completely run past everybody, but I wanted to do some fighting, and I wanted to do a little bit of sabotage and espionage and run around and just dropping some subterf subterfuge on these people, and it works to a certain extent, but a couple of them have bows, uh, you're never going to sneak up on the dogs unless you're using like gatching sugar because they are quite alert and... The dog's dying one hit, thankfully, which is one of the one of my favourite areas of balance in this game. I don't really like the balance in this game. In fact, I would go as far to say as I think it's garbage. But the monkeys and the dogs are really immaculate with that. And it's the same thing when a, an enemy has a weak point. If an enemy has a very specific weak point in this game, whatever the counter is to it is usually very effective, and I like that. But it's also a very limiting factor too, because it means that unless you do that one thing, you're not going to see any real success. And that's the problem. The problem when you limit yourself in such a way, it means that everybody has to kind of play it in the same manner. Uh, for instance, the shield guys that are going to be coming up on this level, they, these are an enemy that are almost exclusive to certain parts of the game. You don't see this enemy very much. But when you do, if you have the monkey axe, you can hit them with that and it's an instant kill. It's incredibly powerful. It's really, really cool. But if you don't have the monkey axe, it turns into this Laurel and Hardy event of being frustrated by an enemy that you have to bait into doing a lunge so that they can overextend and then you can punish them from behind. And it, it just doesn't really flow into the, the nature of potentially what the combat could have been as I'm trying to do executions on people that aren't moving and I'm getting nothing. Here's the guy with the axe and then the drunken guy behind him. You'll notice I'm using the shuriken a lot. Uh, the shuriken is my go-to prosthetic to use because it can be good for interrupting and it can be good for closing distance. 
The problem is, right now, I don't have the move that lets me cover the distance, so I can't even use it. Also, in that fire just to my left, there is a prosthetic known as the Flame Vent. One of my favourite prosthetics in the game. Incredibly powerful, but because in this playthrough I'm not going to be upgrading them, uh, it's definitely not as strong as it could be, and I'm not going to be using too many of the prosthetics outside of some of the more cooler strategies that I'm going to be sharing. Uh, but just know that I will be upgrading the, the, the Shuriken ability so that I can do the closing move afterwards, because that's the whole point of using it in my opinion. But something worth speaking of, which I haven't talked about, is the push that you saw that Axeman doing to me. There are a lot of enemies in this game that have a push, and the push is designed to stun and knock you off balance, but it doesn't do damage, thankfully. It's incredibly annoying, and sometimes it can do enough hit stun to put you in a move for long enough to be killed, but fundamentally, when you get pushed by somebody, it's usually a very fast attack, but the trade-off is it does not hurt. It just puts you at disadvantage, and that's not really a, a new place to be in this game, seeing as how almost everything puts you at disadvantage. But in this room here is the axe. Uh, feel free to go back to the dilapidated shrine to get your treasures, upgrade your prosthetics. Unfortunately, you can't just use them. You have to have the sculpt to install them, or they will not be functional. Uh, which is another one of those wonderful holdalls from Dark Souls, which I really don't understand. If this game wants to be an action game, don't make us go arbitrarily back to a fucking merchant to unlock things. But just there was a transition from going back to the dilapidated temple and then coming back. It respawned all the enemies, so I didn't want to engage in that, so I'm just going to come over here instead. You'll notice I now have a loaded axe, and there's another transition just up there. Uh, on that piece of footage, I moved over to the other side of an area to try and do some exploring, thinking I was going to find something interesting, and uh, it wasn't anything imperative, so instead of you suffering through me exploring, I just removed it and then came back on myself, got back on the roof, and that's where the crossfade was. But just then is me showcasing what you can do with this axe. It is an incredibly powerful tool at what it does, and what it does well is breaking uh, impenetrable defences. Apparently on the new patch of the game, the Lazulite Axe is one of the most damaging moves now, it's borderline broken, because they've changed its efficiency, and uh, I had the Lazulite Axe, and I did think it was pretty cool, but it'll be interesting to see just how ridiculous it has become for the people who want to use it. But in here is two more guys on the right up there, and then a guy with a, a spear, and I'm going to try and get the attention of the spear guy, because I'm going to show you that you don't really have to engage with this fellow once you have the Makiri counter, because the Makiri counter absolutely wrecks the standard mini boss spear enemies. There's just not much they can do, the posture damage is really high, and you can just piece them about and wait for them to thrust, and because they're so thrust happy, they'll do it a lot. I'm going to put the Ichimonji double on as well, it's a better move for this guy, because he doesn't like to do sweeps, he loves the thrusts. But he gets into this AI pattern now where he wants to hit me with that thrust, with that kind of like sweeping handle hit. If you watch, he's going to do it in a moment. And I aggro some people, that one just there. He wants to hit me with the pummel of his spear for some reason. He keeps doing it, he won't do the thrusts. And now I have the attention of the other people and it gets a little bit shady. So I use the Ichimonji Unji Anji, and then he goes for a move, get the deflect. He goes for the same move again, and then the axe buddy turns up, but there's the thrust. I miss the thrust and I get a lucky parry just then. But he should thrust and we should be able to get rid of him while the axe guy procrastinates. There's the thrust, there's the counter, and then there's going to be a transition now. Because I had a game crash! <laughs> Which is always cool. But luckily, it saved me in the right place. Which is one of those rarities. So you'll notice that the, the environment is generally in the same position it was as it was before. The only difference being is, I didn't lose my save thankfully. But that's only the second time the game has crashed for me, which I think is actually pretty good. It crashed on the main menu, and then it crashed just then. Fingers crossed it doesn't happen again. And it was just before the idol as well, which is... <laughs> it doesn't get more douchey than that, but what can you do? As I said at the beginning of the video though, guys, this was a session that was interrupted numerous times for, for several different reasons. And I think it was just God's way of telling me that I shouldn't have been recording that day. But there is a, a nice path over here that skips this entire encounter that I'm doing. If you jump in the water to my left, you will go to a secret area where there is a prosthetic called the Mist Raven, and you'll fight one of those one-armed guys. If you do that, you can then jump down to this area behind all of those enemies. What I wanted to showcase here was just getting past this entire encounter so you can get to Owl and get the key. You have to talk to Owl here. If you don't talk to him, you cannot open the door. 
which is one of the strangest facets of this particular area. But I do really love how this area looks. It is a beautiful environment, but once you talk to him, it's going to lock off the way back. So we're going to be warping back for the Mr. Raven a little bit later on. It's not a tool that I'm going to use too much, even though I do quite like it, it can be useful. But I prefer to use the umbrella personally, because I feel like the umbrella is just a better option for the things that I like to use it for. If you're in the mood for going behind enemies, then the Mr. Raven can be like the best tool in the game. And I cannot deny its, its effectiveness, because it is very, very useful. But cruising over here now, we're going to be doing a little bit of stealth. Get rid, of, get rid of a couple of guys. There's a man with a bow behind some bamboo to our left. He's the person that I really want to slay. Because once I get rid of him, I can skip the rest of this without fear of being hit. And because he is an archer, he does not have the strongest defense. Which is one of the, the nice aspects of the balance. But I suppose it's worth saying that, isn't it? People have wondered if my opinions have changed about this game because I'm making this walkthrough. And for some reason there seems to be this misnomer that if you play a walkthrough and your gameplay is better, you somehow have completely changed your opinion on how you feel about the game. And that observation could not be further from the truth. It really couldn't. Like, I still feel the exact same thing about this game that I did when I finished my playthrough. Everything I said in my playthrough, I still think. I still feel that way. The only difference being is, I've learned how to play the game the, the way the game wants me to play it. That's the only distinction here, guys. The only difference is the gameplay is better for me. The game is not is not different. Me being better at the game has not changed what the game is. It's still the same game. And it never will change the game, because From Software have made a very specific type of game, and I do not love it. However, that does not mean I cannot make a really good walkthrough, and I'm going to try my best to make the best walkthrough that I can to help the people who do love this game. Because that's my job, right? But this is the area where you can skip those enemies. If you come over here, you have to cut this bamboo barricade and then you jump up here and we're going to be taking on a guy. And uh, I'm going to show you the strength of the Senpu Temple Kick as I missed my wall kick just then, which was really confusing. I've never missed the kicks here, ever. And I'm not somebody who spams the button, I only press it once. But for some reason it just, uh, it dropped me. But you see him on the roof, he's just up there. Purple geezer. Here he comes. So this guy has some very telegraphed attacks that lead into sweeps. This is one of them. So you see that? Boom. And then almost the fight is over. And you'll notice I use the kicks then after the initial counter. That's something I never do. But I know with this opponent, if I do those two kicks and I keep the pressure on his guard, he will then do a quick kick that I can deflect afterwards. And as long as you know that he's going to do that quick kick, it can be quite, uh, quite decent. But now that we've got that, there's going to be some uh, teleporting going on. We got the item that we needed. We're going to be back to the forward end of the Harata estate. And then from here, uh, we're going to be moving forward. So, this sequence is going to lead us to the Drunkard boss. A boss that uh, I go for a strategy that I used the last time I played the game that enabled me to isolate him and decimate him. It doesn't work because Sekiro, and then I end up getting an even better strategy for other people, which is I'm, I managed to isolate him in a position where you can get a stealth kill at the beginning, and I'm not going to do it, because the whole point of this is to show you the fights and to show you some strategies and things, and I feel like if I fight the boss the, you know, with both his life bars, I can show you everything he's got, I can show you how you deal with it, and I can show you how to be comfortable while doing so. But if you don't want to do that, you can just uh, follow the strategy and then stab him immediately. So, swings and roundabouts. But there's two guys here. I'm going to go for a block, probably. Uh, usually when I do that encounter, he's immediately swinging at you. One of the things you'll notice when you do an execution on somebody, death blows grant you invincibility, and they grant you a, a flinch when you... It, when you begin that move, once that move activates, it generally stuns enemies for like a second and interrupts what they're doing. And then afterwards, as you come out of it, the enemies will try to frame trap you by attacking. So it's always best to be defensive coming out of a death blow if you're close to an enemy, because it's the smartest thing to do. The second smartest thing to do is to run away, or to, to strike, depending on the spacing. But this is the strategy, guys. I get rid of the shield man, and then I stand over here. And what happened when I did this last time is... 
the enemies found me like this guy's gonna do, and I killed them. But the boss found me too. So the boss came all the way around here, into this corner, and we had a fight. And it was claustrophobic, but it was just a one-on-one, -on -one, and I was able to just wreck him, which was a really, really good thing, right? Isolating a boss from a group of mobs. But this time, the boss walks forward from his seat, and then he resets and doesn't go back. So instead, the only people that I have to contend with are a bunch of soldiers who pretend not to know where I am, but of course, they know where I am, because that's just how the game works. But here is this fellow just here, doing his thing. And I wanted to go for the wall uh, assassination, but I fucked it up. But there we go. He's down. The man over there is walking through the pool. We don't have to worry about him. There's a lot of Simbas and Embers that are sailing the air right now because, of course, the estate is burning. But this is when I notice that the strat is not working. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to attack the rest of the enemies, get rid of all of them, and then I'm going to reset the fight by quitting out of the game. When you quit out of a game, when you initiate a battle with somebody, it will usually de-aggro them and reset them. It will give them their HP back and it will put them back into the position they were last recorded to be in, usually. And you can use this as your advantage to a, a lot of situations. Uh, this has been something that you can do in every single FromSoft Souls-like game, where quitting out can put you into a very powerful position if you know what you're doing. And I'm going to be using it frequently in in this walkthrough, just to give me a better position to fight the bosses. You do not have to do this, obviously. It's entirely up to you how you want to do it. It's just for me, uh, because of the way that I'm playing the game and I'm, the, the things I'm trying to do with the strategies, it revolves around the game being in my favour and the situations being in my control. And if I can orchestrate that by a quit out, I'm going to do it. Here's a shield guy. Uh, the best tip for the shield guys is to swing early. If you swing early, they will never counter hit you, but if you swing too early, you'll miss. So you need to be careful, but spacing is really key against those enemies. Throw your shuriken at the archer, he'll go down in about three shurikens, and then all we need to do now is execute the final guy with the torch. And then once we've executed this guy, because I've aggroed him and he's so close, I'm going to quit out. So I run away, and then I time the quit, and here we go. When I quit out, he will be all the way back at the other side of the room, and then the fight can start from the beginning. He will buff, usually. This is one of the things I wanted to control. There's his palm thrust. Be very careful with those palm thrusts. His right ankle is a hitbox, and I don't know why. It's really bizarre. So did you see how he stepped his foot down? If that touches you, it does damage. But I have some really nice counters to some of this guy's moves. Fundamentally, you want to learn his deflection times. It's going to help. You can deflect this if you want. You can step around this because the hitbox is really fair and it doesn't have bad tracking. And then do not use the Senpu kicks on this guy. Uh, they tend to miss more than they hit because it's just one of those weird encounters where you don't get the, the actual perilous punish. But this right here is a grab. If you sidestep it to the left, it will never hit you. There is the... See what I mean? All it does is miss. If you block his, thr his thrusts, he usually does the overhead that you can step around. That's the move that I want to do, because it's just the best move. See what I mean? I'm not getting any punish for these moves. There's his, that's a really bad move, that one. That's the move that's going to hit you the most, because you just never see it. That first kick he did has actually a hitbox, and then the second heel drop has one too. So you have to block the first one. Luckily for me, I wasn't in range, but I still saw it, so I still blocked it. But here we go. There's the grab. Punish the grab. Here's his combo. Whenever you deflect this man, it tends to extend his strings. So if he normally does one hit when it doesn't hit you, he might do four. You want to be real careful with him. But learn his pattern, because you're going to fight a few of those in the game. And then this guy turns up, Nogami Gensai, and starts showboating when he wasn't even in the fight. But, good piece of information for you if you want to just do this any way you can. If you go to him, he's in the, in the lake just behind us. If you talk to him, he'll help you fight. And the best way to use him is to clear out all the enemies, then go and talk to him, and then with him try and gangbang the boss. It's the closest you'll get to co-op in this game, and it works. Uh, however, for the purposes of the strategy, I didn't want to show that, but it's really good to know that because it's going to make you far more effective than you would be on your own. And if you're having problems with deflecting, if you're having problems playing the game the way that the game wants it to be played, it might be the piece of strategy that helps you get by.
And another thing that's worth mentioning too, you do not have to do this. You do not have to come here. This is a completely optional place. And I think it's worth coming here because it has some of the best prosthetics in the game. It also is one of my favourite areas in the game because I, I do like all the residential areas and the, you know, the the buildings and and the fire, the flame, the idea of this this fallen kingdom, this cataclysm that's happening around us. I do like that idea and I think it's a, a really, really nice motif. But I'm gonna run past him because he gets a he gets a bad rap, that guy. He gets killed repeatedly to get back to this boss. It's really not his fault, it's more the case of the run back. But use the hidden temple key that Owl gave us, and then through here you're gonna be engaging with a very agile boss. So my strategy for Lady Butterfly is pretty simple. I'm gonna hit her till she deflects me, and then I'm gonna deflect her. If that doesn't happen, I'm gonna do other things. I'm gonna generally chase her down with shurikens. Right then, I use the flame vent to counter her jumping kick, which is very, very interesting, and I don't recommend it, but it looks cool, so I wanted to show it. And uh, all of these moves, if you know the timings to get the deflects, they're not too bad. Back away from the kick, go into some hit strings, wait for the deflect, then deflect her. Thankfully, due to the temple kicks, I'd already got her posture incredibly high, so I didn't have to worry too much. And then if you come over here, she's going to spawn directly in front of me. If you want, you can charge a flame vent, you can charge an Inchimonji, you can do whatever it is that you like to do. In this phase, being aggressive can be very rewarded. However, she immediately summons the fucking illusion, because I do the wrong thing, because I'm an idiot. And uh, I'm going to have to dodge a bunch of undead settlement fellas. So... This is an intimidating pattern that's actually not that bad at all, and you can still be aggressive at the boss if you want to, because these enemies are not the smartest. But what I like to do is I like to engage her a little bit, move away from her to the opposite side of the room, and then when she turns them into fireballs, if you stand behind a pillar, the pillar will absorb them. If you're aggressive enough and she gives you the right pattern, she'll never summon these illusions. There was a part of me that was tempted to just keep doing this fight until I got the aggressive pattern where I can just kill her really quickly, but I don't think that that helps the most people, because more people are going to have to dance with her like I'm doing right now than they are going to anything else. And if she does this, this is perfect. This is exactly what you want, see what I mean? And she's dead in a second, because the Senpu kicks counter her really well. There can be only one. And there you go. Lady Butterfly, a boss that a lot of people struggle with, goes down. It is worth saying as well, there is a technique for her where you do like one attack and then you dodge to the side and you do one attack and you dodge to the side and she really can't do anything about it. It's a very powerful strategy, but it's not my kind of strategy so that's the reason why I don't use it. Good to know though, knowledge is power remember guys. And then we transfer all the way back across to Ashina Castle. And it might not look it ladies and gentlemen, but this area has actually had a mild upgrade from what we've been doing. These enemies might look like a bunch of grandfathers in their dressing gowns, but they have a lot of crushing capacity to break your posture. They do a lot of damage, they have a lot of interesting hit strings, and you are not going to just mash them down like you do a lot of the enemies. I mean, if you, if you get lucky, and maybe you will, but fundamentally, these guys are going to put up a bit more of a fight than the enemies that you're used to, so you want to be as careful as you can with them. I really like fighting them, because they are an interesting fight, but oftentimes they come in twos, and fighting enemies in this game in twos can be very difficult, uh, for quite obvious reasons. But we've upgraded the shuriken now, there's the thrust, always punish that. You see how many times I'm hitting this dude, and he's deflecting me and he's got his own push? So you, you need to be very, very aware, because this guy's going to make you earn it. And there are a lot of enemies in this game that you'll never have to earn it from. The night jars go down too quickly without the demon bell. You know, the standard dudes go down immensely quickly. Even the fountainhead guys go down quickly if you poison them. But these fellas, these fellas will definitely give you a, a run for your money. But go through the hidden wall, pick up the item, it's a prayer bead, spoiler alert. And then over here there's going to be a light coin purse, just in case you need to do some purchasing. How you use your money and your abilities are entirely up to you guys in this game. I'm going to be going for some pretty specific stuff. As I mentioned earlier, I've got the Ichimonji, I've gone for the Senpu Kicks, I'm going to get Shinobi Eyes to upgrade the Makiri, because it just makes a lot of sense. Um, pretty much, I'm going to get the ability to use uh, prosthetic tools in the air, I'm going to get the ability to follow up certain prosthetic tools, nothing too extravagant, nothing too ridiculous. And then up here, if you run to this idol, you'll probably get chased, so now's a great time to get ready to fight. 
And then when you've done this, you can rest at this idol, and then you can take on uh, the janitor character, a legendary folk in Sekiro lore. This man has swept up every single room in this castle for the last 65 years, and he's done so not with a mop, but with his 30-foot sword. And uh, we're going to engage him quickly, and then engage into the parry dance with this man. This is a double parry, this move, and if you do it twice, you will break his posture. It is a very fast attack, and it can be quite awkward to react to until you learn when, and then, like most things in this game, uh, once you have an idea of the timings, uh, it becomes very, very easy. And I say very, very easy. The biggest problem I think Sekiro is going to have is that once you learn all of the parries, most of the enemies are going to have no surprises, and it's, it's definitely going to hurt the longevity, because when you play this game on New Game Plus, the game doesn't change. It's, it's kind of interesting the way they've decided to do it. But up here is going to be the 1v1 against Genichiro. We're playing as Genichiro, so it's this wonderful meta game right now. And aggression is key to this fight. The more aggressive you are, the quicker this will be over. And the only things that you need to bear in mind is, is that Genichiro, when he deflects you, can do one of two things. He can do a left attack or a right attack. His right attack is faster, but not by much and getting used to parrying those two moves is key. Additionally, if you get any distance from him, he will start using a bow. Be very careful of the bow. The bow can be rather dangerous. And then finally, when he jumps in the air, he has a mix-up. So after he comes down from jumping in the air, he can either do a thrust or a sweep. In phase one, he will almost always do the thrust. In phase two, he will almost always do the sweep. But he can mix it up, and you need to be aware of this, or you'll die. And then the final phase is actually the easier phase, which is against the form that I'm taking on right now. He always opens with a jumping thrust, so counter it. Here is his lightning. If you want to do the lightning reversals, feel free, they do incredible damage, but they also hurt you, and there's no way to stop them hurting you, so I'm not going to use them. But, same concept here, guys has mix-ups, has all kinds of very similar looking moves. This is a scary move, but if you jump away from it, you should be okay. And because you're at a distance, he'll usually try to cover the ground the same way he did before, by thrusting, but he's already dead. There can be only one. And that was a pretty quick Genichiro. Doesn't really give me opportunity to kind of express how difficult he can be when you don't know him. But by the end of the game, folks, you're going to know him like the back of your hand. It's just one of the repercussions of a, of a very poor design choice later on. But that's going to give you access to Bloodsmoke Ninjutsu. This is one of the most powerful stealth mechanics in the game. And it's going to enable you to cause all kind of tomfoolery and shenanigans that will lead to just absolute destruction. So enjoy that. It's a very empowering tool if you can use it. But it can only be used on a stealth attack. It cannot be used on a standard uh, death blow, which seems to be un unfortunate. However, there is a technique known as jumping over an opponent, where you can jump over them and then death blow them from behind, and that usually gives you access to those techniques. So, there is a way around it, which is really nice. And then, of course, remember to use your attack power to increase so that you can do as much damage as you can physically do in this game, which is to say absolutely nothing. And then, once you've talked to Kuro enough, he's going to tell you to look for this guy, who is called Ishin. You might, rem you might remember this guy from uh, his voice, if you are attentive, and there's a couple of details in his room that will also tell you the, uh, the identity to this man, because you've actually met him before, but he's going to tell you where the Mortal Blade is. It's very important that you interact with him, because then when you come back to the tower, this library is going to be open, and it's going to have the Gunfort key. You're not going to see the Gunfort in this video, uh, but you are going to uh, be seeing it in the next one, and it's very, very useful, and it's it's key for success in moving forward. But there's a transition back to Senpu Temple. We came here earlier on in the game. We've already opened up all of the idols. This right here is going to be quite interesting, because all of the Voldo enemies are dead in this room, and I wanted to show you a method to getting a stealth kill on this guy. I, uh, I wasn't going to include this fight in the walkthrough, because you don't have to do it. Uh, but I decided to throw it in there just because I'd recorded it. I intended for this to go on the cutting room floor. Hence why you don't have the footage of me killing all the enemies in this room. 
but the enemies, you can stealth attack all of them, even when they're aware of you, and all you do is jump towards them and hit them. So it's it's one of those enemies that's, that's very easy. You can also use shurikens to get rid of them too, but I just wanted to, to throw him in there just in case you were struggling with him and you needed some advice. And then there's a transition over here to the folding screen monkey boss, which is another interesting fight as well. So at the very beginning here, guys, there's going to be a monkey behind you. I'm going to use Gatchin Sugar, and I'm going to kill the first monkey. Now that I've done that, I'm going to use the Sugar, which is going to make me harder to spot. And then from here, I'm going to move through this environment using Firecrackers to stun the monkeys and then to kill them. Each of the monkeys has a gimmick. Uh, the gimmicks themselves can be kind of ignored if you do this well enough. So as soon as you land, throw a Cracker, try and kill this guy. I can't hit him for the life of me right now, I don't know why, the detection's been really weird. But there you go. And then from there, I'm going to move over to this roof, and I'm hopefully going to chase the red guy over to that left roof. If he jumps on this roof, when you land, if you turn to face the opposite direction towards us now, and throw a firecracker, it will always stop him, and then you can kill him. And then now there's only one guy left. And this one guy left is... is the dude that I don't really know where he goes that much. So I'm going to go to a roof, I'm going to hopefully see him, and then I'm going to chase him down. But in my mind right now, I'm thinking he's the guy that hides on the uh, upper floor of this temple, so I'm uh, coming over to this to see if I can spot him. And right now, I can hear monkeys because the phantom monkeys are chasing me, but I do not hear the proper monkey. So I'm going to go in here and double check to make sure he's not on the rafters. If he was on the rafters, this would have been perfect. But alas, he's not. So we have to deviate a little bit and go back towards the tree. When in doubt, go back towards the tree. There's all the spectral monkeys. There's another one super close. Is he on the tree? I heard him just then. I think he just jumped on a tree bow. You can hear the tree moving. Where did he go? Is he over there? Look at him jumping. <laughs> so the more monkeys that you've killed, the more of these uh, shadows that will be attacking you, which is something worth knowing. But I just cannot see the monkey right now. Uh, I am not the master of this fight, guys. I, I don't really like this fight. I think it's stupid. I don't think it's bad. I think it's an interesting distraction, and I welcome the diversity, but I will take a proper fight any day over whatever this was. That was so terrible, I think you gave me cancer. But there's the folding monkeys. It can go really quick. It can go really long. It all depends on the, the flow that you get, the pattern that you get, and how you choose to do it. If you do not want to deal with that ever again, watch a speedrunner do it. They do it in like 10 seconds. They know how to manipulate it perfectly. They make it look effortless. The problem with this walkthrough, guys, is that I don't want to watch speedrunners because it's going to influence my abilities and my uh, strategies. I wanted to bring you the methods that I use to succeed and the methods that I found success with that are utilizing the way I feel that From Software wants us to play this game. So that's kind of the mantra that I'm using moving forward as I get the Mortal Blade off of this kid. And now we get access to a really, really cool sword that you will barely use. So whoop whoop. And then now I'm going to be going towards unlocking the old grave. So if you land on that beam in the middle of Ashina Castle, you can assassinate this guy. I'm going to throw a firecracker to stop these dudes from frame advantaging me. And then I'm going to immediately go into a death blow to stop him. And then I'm going to back away from that little engagement. Go for the block, but don't need to because he didn't attack through. He pushes me. I parry him. We go into the death blow. On this floor here, there's going to be a prosthetic. It is a small poison knife. That's one of my favorite prosthetics, but it's... It's kind of bullshit how expensive this knife can be to poison people. Uh, some people it's great, others not so much, but that's the Sabimaru. Uh, it's really, really fun to use. It's, it's a cool weapon, but it's definitely an emblem chugger. And I'm hoping that maybe when they adjust the economy in the game, they'll adjust how much it uses for that. But down here, there's going to be another one of the spear guys. There's also going to be a idol behind him, so I'm going to just stab him quickly take on his buddy. That was really nice of the game, wasn't it? To put the fucking coin purse up when I'm waiting on a parry. <laughs> Why does it do that? Like, how many of those purses have I picked up? Was that the first one I've picked up and that's the reason it shows it? Because if it isn't, stop showing it, game. No one gives a fuck. It's such a dumb design. <laughs> but from here, if you drop down onto the roof, you can talk to Blackheart. And I make a mistake here, guys. Do not come here unless you have at least, like, 3,000 money. 
I fucked it up so hard just then. I was really pissed off at myself. So, you want to buy the fan from him, you want to buy the anti-air death blow, and you want to buy the, uh, the sugar from him. Those are the things that I recommend you purchase. I have 1,700 sen right now because I went and got money, went back, and he'd already moved. And then when you face him in the other area, you seemingly can't get anything from him anymore because he doesn't sell you things. So, before you go in that initial engagement, make sure you have the money that you need. I thought I was just going to turn the trainer on and use infinite money, but then I couldn't be asked to do that because it gives me like 9999999999 money, and then I have to explain to you guys why I have 9999999999 money, and then there's always that one dude that's like, Oh, this guy's a cheater! And it's like, dude, if you can name a single fucking thing that the money can help me out in this game, I'd love to know. Because if I could bribe the bosses and not fight them and end the game, and that's the best strategy through the game, I'd be fucking doing it, you know? <laughs> but... I didn't do that because I wanted to avoid those those inevitable comments and instead I ended up fucking myself so I can't help but feel like I am to blame but moving over here jump into this area and we're coming up on a mandatory piece of damage here guys which I'm going to edit around you can avoid this damage by going around a different way but if anybody knows how you drop down here without taking damage I'd love to know because just then was an edit of me uh, linking footage and it's mandatory there is nothing to stop it and I don't understand I've tried kicking off the wall I've tried using the fucking mist raven in the air when I land I've tried all kinds of stuff I've tried using sugars and it just boggles my mind because in Dark Souls there's a way to stop fall damage within reason in Demon Souls there's a way to stop fall damage within reason in Bloodborne there's a fucking way to stop fall damage within reason why does this game not have them? I just don't understand that. It's such a step backwards, and it makes no sense. And in Bloodborne, it was connected to a rune, which made it kind of eclectic, and some people didn't realise that's how it worked. And I'm hoping there's a way to do it in this game, I just don't know how. So if you know, guys, how to stop fall damage, that would be amazing, because I don't. And I just, I feel like any part of a game that forces mandatory damage on you is garbage and should be deleted. But use Gatchin Sugar here, guys, to give you an extra veil of, of mystery and mystique. Take out the guy with the shotgun and then come over here and, and take on the snake eyes. I really do not like this opponent coming up. And thus, I'm actually going to use the stealth attack to get rid of the first HP bar. This is a boss that is pretty reliable once you know the pattern. But if you're anything like me, I, I just really don't like fighting her. The camera, the room, the other guys with the guns, all of it can get really, really bad. So the strategy here is simple, guys. We're going to deflect, and we're going to do Ichimonji. And then we're going to deflect, and if she grabs us, we're going to throw Ash at her to interrupt her grab. And that's all we're going to do. Deflect, Ichimonji. If she grabs, throw Ash. And just repeat until you take her out. And if you want to use a buff, if you want to use Divine Confetti, I recommend doing it. There's not a single NPC in this game that annoys me as much as she does. Uh, she was my kryptonite in my first run, because I kept getting grabbed. The grab is like the slowest thing on the planet, but it hit me almost every single time. And there's nothing more tilting than getting grabbed by something that you saw, you dodged, and then you ran back to punish and you got hit by it because it was so long it still got you. But that's what she'll do, folks, because that's the kind of player that she is. And you can get a weird memory leak with that character, too. And I don't know how you do it, but I've done it myself. It's in my blind playthrough. At certain points, she can get a pattern where all she does is kick. And it doesn't make any sense. She doesn't do any other move. She just kicks repeatedly, and she's the easiest thing in the game. But it's so difficult to do that and to get that happen that it's not something you can rely on. But dodge the cocks like a beast, and then we're going to be running through the, the misty area here coming up. So there's a sub-boss coming up here, which is a variant of the drunkard that we killed in the Harata estate. I'm going to skip him, purely because he's surrounded by monkeys, and all he gives is a prayer bead, which I'm not using the prayer bead, you might be using them, so I can show you where he is. The strategy for him is the exact same that I used on the other drunkard, but I just don't really see the point in particularly taking him on. Like, the other guy, I can understand because it's a new enemy that you've not seen before, and taking him on is something that can help. But this guy, you don't need to fight him anymore, we've already fought him. So Tokijiro the glutton can carry on with his life, unabashed by our interventions. 
as we move over here and do some grappling hooking. But once you hook up to this pathway, there's going to be a tree with a person hanging on it. And then we're going to be able to jump across it onto the roof and then take on probably the easiest mini boss in the game. Which is going to be one of the, the Mist Nobles, I think they're called. And this is a bit of foreshadowing to an area that you're going to go to later on, which is actually pretty sweet. And this is me wanting to show you the Sabi Maru, but I didn't have it because I've not gone back to the idol. So instead, uh, I end up just swapping out the Ichimonji back to the Senpu Kicks. And then here is the boss. This boss will never attack you. This boss is literally just a, a punching bag. It's really strange. It just has no poise to do anything, has no block potential. It just gets its ass whooped. And then when it dies, it releases this interesting mist effect, which I think is really cool. And then it shows you what the illusion was hiding. And the mist itself was hiding this illusion of opulence, when really this entire area is ruined. It's wilted. It's emaciated. It's almost as if it's been sucked dry, right? Which is a wonderful piece of uh, narrative projection for what's going to be revealed later on, right? But be careful here, I actually fell trying to- see that grapple point down there that's baiting me into using it? When I jumped towards that grapple point, mashing grapple when the grapple symbol was there, it disappeared and I fell to my death and... I didn't fall to my death, it just did a little bit of damage, but you know what I mean. I, I just- I don't understand how this game can have a grapple and make it so fucking worthless sometimes. It's... <laughs> it really amuses me it does. Because right now there are people on the internet that think this game is a 10 out of 10. They think this is the best game ever made. They think it's better than all the souls combined. And I think these people are fucking lunatics. Because there's so much in this game that does not work. It's like, how can you think this game is fucking perfect when the grapple mechanic, a fundamental principle of platforming, fails you? Like, it's just bizarre. I just, I can't even begin, man. Oh, be careful, by the way. This guy has upgraded poison moves. They do not hurt you on your block, but they will stack up poison, which is really good to know. I don't know if they hurt you if they block them, but if you deflect them, you should be safe. And this particular enemy, you don't have to kill him. I only fight him because he's new and because he's interesting. And that's an enemy that's going to be imperative that you learn, because if you don't, you're going to have trouble. But right there is another one of the memorial mobs. And then we're going to be entering into Mibu Village. Mibu Village is one of my favourite areas in the game. It has a really, really interesting concept of... Uh, they are a cult that worship, essentially, this, this, this refined sake that's given to them. But the problem with this sake is that it does not quench their thirst. Much like alcohol in real life, it makes them more dehydrated. Only, this sake is so much worse. It makes them crave the drink even more. And they crave it so much that they eventually imbibe from the lake itself. And the lake is, is something that you should not be drinking from. Because, I, with what I believe, there is some kind of parasite in the lake, potentially. And you can see it on some of the fishing symbols. And it's one of the areas of the game where a lot of people have speculated that it potentially has some kind of hark back to Bloodborne with the idea of the invertebrates, which I think is a really interesting stra uh, really interesting theory, and it's pretty cool. But it doesn't necessarily have to link, it's just this idea, isn't it, that there is something potentially unholy and impure in this water that is essentially controlling this entire town. This eldritch evil that awaits silently beneath the depth of the waves is uh, is fucking everybody up and I love that idea because it's very Lovecraftian and it's very cool and you get this story by an NPC that's in one of the buildings but we're not going to be doing that because I'm going to be avoiding most of this area because there's no real reason to do much here the enemies go down in one to two hits so there's no real challenging fighting them this entire environment is an area that's ripe for farming because it has a lot of access over here is a god seed for people that need those extra heals and then up here, next to the guy with the bell, you can see the the parasites. They're like they look like sea slugs that are on top of those those red regalias, which is kind of interesting, right? And we know that this place is connected to Fountainhead, which is kind of the uh, apotheosis that they wish to have. They want to have this transformation, you know. They want to ascend, and unfortunately, like a lot of ascensions in cults. It's generally not a good thing. But moving forward now, we're going to be taking on everybody's favourite NPC, Orin of the Water. And I'm going to show you a strategy to get a backstab on her at the beginning. And it's going to be a cut right now to me jumping on her head. And you'll notice, her heart appears. 
So if you do not want to fight this woman, and I don't blame you because she can be a fucking nightmare, that's what you do. However, I'm going to fight her, and I'm going to buff, and I'm going to buff with everything I've got, because this enemy is very difficult at this part of the game, because your attack power does no damage to her. You are doing chip damage the entire fight. But a couple of things that are worth noting, when she jumps at you in, in mid-air slowly, she'll do one hit into a sweep, and if you punish that sweep with the Senpu kicks, you can do incredible damage. The, here it is. This is the move you want. However, she can do a fast attack like that, and she can also do a spinning arcing uh, series of combos, and if you do not know the hit strings, she'll break your guard, because she's very, very powerful. And here it is. Just then, I did two deflects, and I was almost at max posture, so if I drop any of those other slashes, and there are a few that are coming, uh, I am donezoed. Absolutely donezoed. But there you go, there was Orin. We, we took her out. She's a beast. And now we can move on now and talk to the NPC in the building from underneath the floor, and then we can take on the Corrupted Monk. But there's a couple of things that I want to talk about here. Uh, the, the most powerful sugar gives you a 25% damage increase. It never feels like that because the damage in this game is so pitiful at times it makes me want to die. But the one thing that I really don't like about that particular buff is when you use it, it, it makes your HP really small. I don't mind that. That doesn't bother me at all. But here's where the game is really inconsiderate. You know when that buff runs out? It doesn't fucking heal you. So it, it makes your life really small, and then it gives you your bar back, and it takes off a massive chunk of your life for no reason. Absolutely no reason. It actively injures you because of the way it's designed. And it shouldn't do that, dude. When you come out of that buff, if you didn't take a hit, it should give you that HP back. It shouldn't just be, here, trade half of your HP to use this fucking sugar that's already fucking worthless. Like, it's really, really stupid, and I completely disagree with it. But thanks to some uh, clever editing, <laughs> we got around it. And now we can take on arguably one of the more difficult bosses in the game because it completely ignores the rules of the game. <laughs> and you can no longer stealth kill this boss too, which is unfortunate. But this is a five hit combo and on the fifth hit use the umbrella. If you use the umbrella you do not get pushed back. It's the same thing with everything. Same with the Makiri counters. Never Makiri counter this boss. It will help the boss. Use the umbrella instead. Keep up the pressure. And hopefully, if you learn the patterns as I have, you'll get to the point where you understand all of its moves, and you can punish it accordingly, and we can get very rare footage of somebody breaking this boss's posture without it losing too much HP. Just through sheer aggression, and by knowing the pattern. And there it was. There can be only one. Corrupted Monk. There was a lot happening there, guys, and if you're not, if you're new to the game, you might not be able to understand a lot of it, but the fundamental principle is that the Umbrella is your best friend for blocking moves that leave you in block disadvantage. Any move that streaks you back across the ground in a guard, even when you deflect it, if you block that with the Umbrella, it will not give you that animation. You can do it on Makiri counters, so you don't have to do the Makiri counter, and it's also an easier block because it has more generous frames. If you are not using the umbrella, I'm hoping that that fight just then has inspired your creativity and given you a reason to try it out, because it's the best prosthetic tool you are not using. And it enabled me to keep her posture as high as it was then, constantly be on the attack, never ever on the back foot, always moving forward, always ripping and tearing and burying our fangs like the wolf that we are. Thank you for watching, and you take care now.